Thank you so much for joining me, Talal. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. How is it seeming for you at the moment? I want to start by setting the stage. We were talking earlier off, off stage in the speaker's lounge about our upbringing on a global stage from the Americas to here in the Middle East. And I want to hear from you about the parallels when we're talking about the development of AI. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's definitely something that's quite profound. That, and I think this was touched on in uh, you know, the previous sessions. How we're living in a moment of time where for the first time in human history, there is the possibility of um, having a form factor that is not constrained by the biological substrate that is more intelligent than humanity. And so there's a massive responsibility that comes with that. And I think what we've seen over the past two years, um, and I, I go back and forth to the US quite a bit um, and, and you know, meet with a lot of the different companies, but the innovation is um, incredible. I think it's, it's happening at a pace that's so um, uh, fast in comparison to anything that we've known in terms of other revolutions, the agriculture revolution, the industrial revolution, the information revolution. And I think we're at the cusp of seeing a tool that is going to augment human ingenuity in ways that we can't even fathom at the moment. The panelists on stage earlier spoke about focusing on the positive aspects and the sectors where it's beneficial to do so. Which sectors are you most excited about where AI is really showing an optimistic direction? I think, um, and, and this is something that we're actively uh, involved in at G42, um, there are a multitude of different sectors that are quite conducive to the application of AI. Uh, think of healthcare, for instance. Uh, what we're doing here in the UAE, the government is um, uh, performing what we call the Emirati Genome Program, which is doing whole genome sequencing, long read and short read, with you know, uh, major technology providers like Oxford Nanopore and Illumina for 1.2 million UAE nationals. And it's... Um, going to generate a, a data set. We already are at 700,000 or so fully genomed, um, uh, gen genome sequenced um, individuals and have about 120 petabytes of data. So if you think of that data and you think of applying that, uh, applying compute and AI to that data, you can start to see how you can influence positively drug discovery, precision medicine, preventative care in ways that we haven't been able to before in an, in an accelerated uh, uh, fashion as well. And so we work with partners like MIT's Broad Institute, Microsoft and others in creating a trusted compute environment to ensure that the exchange of that data for those types of uh, research activities can be done in a safe manner that protects privacy, but also induces the positive outcomes that we're trying to uh, support uh, enabling. I want to jump on that. You mentioned the compute environment. So compute power is now often cited as the, the new oil of AI, so to speak. How do you ensure that the emerging markets that we're talking about have access to the necessary AI infrastructure without relying heavily on the Western world or Chinese technologies? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I would equate data to the new oil more so than compute power. I would look at compute as analogous to, um, say, uh, the muscle that's needed to generate um, uh, the result. So if you look at it in the analogy of the human body, data being the food, compute being the muscle, and then the brain power is really the data scientists and the algorithms that are starting to unlock that value. But computation, as you described, is, is obviously a necessary component. And uh, with the scaling laws and what we've seen take place over the past two years, and even more so now with what's happened in the couple, last couple of weeks, we're going to see that um, increase profoundly because, again, on inferencing, serving that AI that goes beyond just training frontier models, but serving that AI and using a lot of those compute cycles to allow the model to think and reason. That's where I think those new breakthroughs can come out and where, where you will have new knowledge being created. So if you think of infrastructure globally, look at it in a way that's kind of analogous to um, electricity. Mm. So what we're doing at G42 is we call this the intelligence grid. We're trying to help build out global AI infrastructure and create what we call an intelligence grid and, and, and really uh, take on a significant portion of the value chain from the physical infrastructure to the digital infrastructure to the AI model development and then the applications and solutions across uh, a few different verticalized industries, including healthcare, geospatial services, energy, and what have you. 
But that compute infrastructure today, if you look globally, there is only about 60 gigawatts of data center capacity. And when you look at what's needed to be able to serve AI to the entire world, in our calculations, it's somewhere roughly between 300 gigawatts and 500 gigawatts that, that would be needed. And if you think of one gigawatt, so not only is it one gigawatt of energy and the energy infrastructure to power that, but stuffing the data center with the, like say, GB300 NVIDIA GPUs, the network topology, the design, everything else in the build out, it's roughly around $45 billion per gigawatt. So do the math. There's no one country in the world or one company in the world that's going to be able to do that on their own. And that's where, you know, even uh, companies like MGX that's been established between Mubadala and G42 are pulling different sources of capital, including BlackRock, Microsoft, and others, to help invest in that digital infrastructure global AI build out. And so that's where we come in and try to support and ensure that we're looking at renewable sources of energy or, or clean sources of energy to power that global infrastructure build out. Let's take a broad strokes approach. We were talking about emerging markets earlier and how there are opportunities that they have to leapfrog over the established economies when it comes to AI innovation. Can you give me an example of how that's taking place? Yeah, there, um, I mean, we've seen a lot of technologies be leapfrogged when you know, cellular phone technology came out and uh, people had to, uh, you know, didn't have to go through the landline route, right? So we're seeing that again effectively with, with AI. The way we look at it is there's an immense amount of responsibility. I mean, you heard in the last panel some of the risks associated, and obviously we need to be mindful of those risks. But we also feel an equal amount of responsibility to ensure the diffusion of that AI is done in a way that provides equitable access to that AI. You, 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 the the socioeconomic negative impact of having um, digital divide in this realm is um, you know, something that we, I, we as a, as a, as a you know, species uh, shouldn't have, have to go through. If you look at also, again, back to the analogy of electricity, uh, Brad Smith from Microsoft always says, you know, it's been 14 decades since electricity powered lower Manhattan. And till today, there are about 770 million people with no access to electricity. We can't afford that same type of scenario um, with intelligence. Mm -hmm. So what we do is, um, in that diffusion, we, we currently have, at least on the digital infrastructure side, multiple deployments in the US, multiple deployments in Europe, deployment here in the UAE, we're looking at Southeast Asia, but one that's notable is in Kenya, where we're leveraging one gigawatt of, of geothermal energy to build out data center infrastructure there and in a sense, replicate the successes we've had in the UAE in terms of solutions and applications for the public sector and regulated industries in Kenya to consume that capacity. Can you touch a little bit on the GPU as a service and cloud-based AI platforms and how your organization is leveraging those models to accelerate the AI deployment in the regions that lack their own infrastructures? Yeah, that's it's an interesting area that's quite nascent. I think if you look at all the hyperscalers, uh, that 60 gigawatts that I said are deployed of data center capacity globally are predominantly IT infrastructure, cloud infra infrastructure. But the energy consumption um, on a pair rack in a data center level for cloud was around 17 kilowatts. And with some of the compute infrastructure we're seeing today, um, they're requiring upwards of 100 kilowatts per rack. And direct-to-chip liquid cooling, different types of architecture. So what we've done is um, adopted a, a new model where with our data center infrastructure company, we're looking at that high density design. So we're developing our IP around that. And then on the digital infrastructure side, we're, we're maximizing optionality by using more than one partner. So in, in the case of um, our deployments in the US and Europe right now, and even here in the UAE, we're using NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, and Cerebras. Mm. That, is kind of attacking the problem in a very different way than um, other providers would, where we're really focused on price performance and both training and inference economics. So where we build that out, uh, subject to obviously high bandwidth connectivity, and we work closely with Etisalat on, on doing that both on a local and a global scale, is how we are um, targeting areas where there are current gaps and trying to bring in partners to help offtake a lot of that capacity and provide the solutions and applications to the communities that um, are in question. You talked about partners. Can we talk about public-private partnerships as well and what role that plays in scaling the AI adoption, especially when it comes to those markets that don't have the same level of investment in its infrastructure? Y yeah, so, uh, you know, in, in many of the countries, we find the same... Um, 
forcing functions that we found over here. You know, everyone uh, is keen on ensuring they protect, again, you know, data being that natural resource that's of high value. You want to maintain sovereignty. So to do that, you, you, you need some form of public-private par uh, partnership. So you need companies there that can help unlock the potential of that data, but then you want to also m make sure that you're not subjecting that data to extraterritorial jurisdictions that are, uh, you know, part of, you know, the policy in many of the technology providers' countries. And so that's where the enablement of digital sovereignty is important. And it's um, important to combine the right types of um, uh, partners together to be able to kind of, uh, uh, you know, achieve that purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, you need off-takers. You need the public sector to understand the value that AI can bring them. But you also um, need to be mindful that not all of that data can um, uh, go outside their borders. They need to be able to protect that in a way that um, is, uh, is, is relevant. And can you touch more on the policies and frameworks that those nations may need to adopt to just maintain that sovereignty as well, while still keeping the cross-border collaboration and innovation that we've seen? Yeah, there's no question that there is going to need to be cross-border uh, data exchange, but doing it in a way that kind of still maintains protection of that data. So uh, for an example of that is what we, we call the sovereign public cloud, somewhat an oxymoron, but uh, we're able to do that because we've capitalized on technology that Microsoft embraced recently in confidential compute, where you have encryption in memory. And that is the way we are enabling sovereignty. So you have that encryption in memory, encryption at rest, and encryption in transit, where you have that full end-to-end -end, um, uh, chain of uh, security among, uh, around the data that's um, highly sensitive in many cases. Um, and then for other types of data sets that are more sensitive, then you, you, you create a different type of approach and you, you deploy a, a kind of a sovereign cloud that's um, air-gapped or uh, disconnected from uh, the internet. So, that optionality is something that we're also able to bring to the table along with the applications and services that we focus on. We were speaking earlier off stage just about the race to AI innovation, mm -hmm. right? And the superpowers that are involved in that stage. But you also said how really we can work unanimously together and why that's more important. Can you touch on that? And especially also because the UAE has really positioned itself as a leader in the space of AI development. Can you touch on what you're doing, and also specifically G20, G42, in building that role, especially also in a more inclusive AI economy? Yeah, I, I think it's quite important for us to um, ensure that we're looking at innovation that comes from all over the world and uh, supporting the development of the global AI ecosystem and being a key contributor to that. Um, in the past few years, we've been uh, laser focused on doubling down with the partners we have predominantly from the US uh, in uh, supporting that infrastructure build out that's going to be required as the backbone to uh, delivering that type of intelligence. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about the you know, positive outcomes we can induce from AI in the different domains that I mentioned and that we are involved in as G42, to the point where if you think of, you know, the smartest human beings that ever lived, if you look at like Einstein or uh, Newton, um, you know, they both had carbon footprints and uh, worked in air-conditioned uh, rooms with multiple different um, really brilliant data scientists and consumed a huge amount of physics and mathematics books, you know, throughout their careers and built on the human collective up until that point. I think what we're seeing with AI is an accelerant of those types of breakthroughs like general relativity or calculus that can come as a product of what we are doing. So. The impact of that is just, in my view, uh, today, something that we don't fully yet realize and appreciate. Would you call yourself an optimist, a realist? Very much so. Very optimist? much an optimist. What are you most optimistic about, especially in the sectors where you're seeing AI d development revolutionize? So uh, I think, you know, on, in the previous uh, session, they, they mentioned, you know, the climate impact that can um, kind of uh, be um, negative or positive depending on how you apply AI. I tend to look at this in a very positive way because you can absolutely use clean sources of energy, but also develop things that help with precision weather modeling, climate action, 
Um, so in the geospace, we have a company called Space42 that's laser focused on um, multiple different areas, but climate being one of them. On healthcare, you know, solving things like cancer should be within reach. Um, if you have, you know, PhD level type data um, uh, scientist type agents that are able to do things without being confined by the biological substrate in, in ways that can um, um, be accelerated. So for me, those two things are, I think, again, back to the responsibility I feel we have as AI practitioners to start to push towards in terms of solutions. And that leads me to my last question. The summit is obviously all about the future of AI. What would you say that you are most excited about within that realm and also how your company can contribute to playing a pivotal role in the region and on a global stage? So uh, we're very lucky to live in a country where you know, the leadership has a very strong conviction. We're all in with conviction when it comes to AI. And this is not a new thing. It's not a new paradigm. It's something that existed even in the, um, I think as early as 2018, we had the uh, Minister of uh, Ministry of AI, Minister of AI, and, um, and a roadmap for AI. This obviously is going to continue to evolve as, as the technology uh, uh, evolves as well. I'm optimistic about all the different potential um, breakthroughs that can come out of it, but I'm most optimistic about our role as the UAE in being a needle mover that can absolutely punch above its weight the way the UAE does. Um, and as a private sector company, we become a, a somewhat a, a tool of soft power and public diplomacy where we can go and extend what we're developing here to other nations and help elevate their digital transformation efforts as well. That's incredible. I'm quite the optimist too. <laughs> I'll join you on that. Skate. Talal al Casey, thank you so much for joining me here at the AI Everything Summit here in Abu Dhabi. Thank you so much. Great thank you for having me.